So really great to take this time, you know, because we are taking a class on mindful awareness practice. Then why not take this opportunity just to return? And in a way, this is our real home, the present moment. And the trouble is because of the habits of our mind, we forget. And we forget because we, in a sense, we believe or get caught up in our thoughts. But actually thoughts are just thoughts here and now. And even intense emotion or other qualities that we feel energetically in the heart, in the body, those are just feelings being known here and now. Thoughts are being known, the underlying feeling is being known, sounds are being known, sights are being known, sensations in the body being known, being felt. It's really the great paradox of our lives that coming into the present moment, being present with conditions is like a radical event. (laughs) It's really ironic. And I'm sure, you know, it's week five, so it's really great that people have hung in there. I certainly know that it isn't easy to learn new skills, to stick with something. And even though in a way it should be, it could be the most natural thing, being present, being in the body. A couple of people just walked in the room, heart is racing, feels like this. And it's just like a profound way to normalize reality. And we're not evaluating the moment as like, oh, I'm good or I'm bad. Rather, it's just a simple, oh, it's like this, feels like this. And it's always about this, I like to think of it, um, and I talk about it sometimes as about who is the heart in allegiance to? Are we in allegiance with the value of being open and present? Or is the heart, is the mind in allegiance to being distracted or constructing some meaning about who I am or what's happening and holding to some fixed idea, some opinion, some point of view. And so when we're, you know, we undertake the training like all of you have, you've signed up for this six week class we're really working on a change of allegiance. We're cultivating a new value. And initially it's very appropriate for there to be some doubt, like what's the big deal about being mindful? What's the big deal about being open or being present? And you can't look to me or somebody to tell you what the big deal is. We have to each of us check it out to see if, it, if there is something that I actually, the heart actually values. Oh yeah, this is, it's really important. It's important enough that I'm gonna set aside 20 minutes a day in a quiet setting to develop that habit, to be present and to sustain present moment awareness. One of the most simple teachings and also well-known teachings from the Buddha. Most of you know he lived 2,500 years ago. He was a human being, of course, like us, had a very powerful insight. And then not only that, he had the right kind of personality that he could articulate what he had come to understand about his own heart and mind in a way that 2,500 years later, different culture, different place, of course. And the words 
still inform our own human experience. And that's because what he understood about the mind is at a deep level, like below the level of our cultural conditioning, which you know, can be quite different from one culture to the next. So we talk about sometimes the nature, the underlying nature of the mind, the underlying nature of experience. And out of that came this very simple teaching. It's just so commonsensical. Abandon or refrain from what is unskillful, cultivate the good, purify the heart, or develop the heart. So I just want to talk about each of those three things in light of our formal meditation practice, you know, the invitation to set aside 45 minutes or 10 minutes or whatever you have every day, or some of you maybe twice a day, depending on what works in your schedule. But really, like I've been saying all along in the class, we're really interested in 24 seven, right? We're cultivating like this lifestyle of mindfulness or this valuing of being present. It's not just during that 30 minute or 20 minute sit that we get to have most days or some days of the week. It's really meant to be all day long. So what does it mean to abandon or refrain from what's unskillful? Well, I'm sure you've noticed as you have in your sits and during the day, as we have more mindful awareness, more present moment awareness, we notice these, I sometimes think of them, or I think Joseph Goldstein, one of my teachers, gave this example like an interstate off-ramp. So we're cruising along, the mind's peaceful, clear, the attitude is good, kind, and generous, and we're in a good place. And then there's an impulse to take an off-ramp, like to regurgitate some ancient pain, somebody did this to me, or plan some exciting future. And and now I'm not judging these off-ramps, but a lot of these off-ramps, these distractions, have a way of encapsulating or you know, creating a bubble. The mind gets lost. The mind forgets that it's like this now. You know how it is, like when we're obsessed with something, almost by definition, when we're really obsessed or spinning with something, there is an absence of knowing, oh, it's like this now. This is what the mind is doing, feels like this, right? We're oblivious. That's kind of the definition of being caught up in thought, is the unawareness that this is happening, that this feels like this. So abandoning what is unskillful just means noticing what the mind is doing, noticing, for example, the quality of the mind or the quality of the intentions in the mind, like is there greed, stinginess, or is there a generosity? I mean, just as an example, knowing the difference between what's skillful and unskillful, because it matters what kind of seeds, what sort of habits are getting watered. Do we always take that off ramp? Like when a little flash of anger gets triggered, do I always spin with it? Do I kind of take the bait, think about it? You know, we imagine what the person did to us, and then we feel the charge of anger. And as we feel the charge of anger, what do we want to do? We want to think about what that guy did to us. So we do. And when we think about what that person did to us, we feel that emotional charge. And when we feel that emotional charge, and that's that vortex of unskillfulness. And there's so many versions of that. You know, it could be fantasizing about something we want to buy, or a relationship, or getting out of a relationship. But probably more than an infinite number of ways for our minds to spin. And our job isn't to get tight when we catch our mind spinning, but just to have a kind of bigger space of wisdom that understands, oh, the mind's spinning. The mind is planting seeds that's going to make it more likely to be spinning in the future. This is tight, constricted. 
this is unskillful, this isn't helping anybody. Right? That's how we abandon the unskillful. We, wisdom and awareness, simply sees unskillful habits for what they are, unskillful. And it's not like theoretical, we're seeing and feeling the unskillfulness directly, immediately, energetically, here and now. So when we plant an unskillful seed, uh, and, you know, water an unskillful habit, it can be detected in the here and now. Just notice, like now or later, when you find yourself, you know, whatever it might be, but engaged in some self-centered drama, and just notice what sort of impression is being left in the heart, mind, and body. That's sort of the energetic equivalent of those seeds that I'm talking about. And one of, uh, one of the teachers, one of the elders in this tradition, um, she's dead now, Ruth Dennison, but here a teacher in the West of these early Buddhist teachings. And she was a real character, uh, immigrant from Europe, from Germany, and uh, she just had a kind of a flamboyant air to her. She was sort of in the Hollywood scene, um, but you know, spent her adult life, most of her adult life, practicing and teaching Buddhism. But anyway, she, she would so sometimes say something like, "You don't get away with nothing, darling." <laughs> and that's this. It's like whatever the mind does, it leaves an impression. So abandoning the unskillful means whether we're in a formal meditation time or just out about doing our day, mindfulness can be there. And mindfulness and wisdom, it cares about, well, what's the mind doing? How's it relating? What kind of seeds? What sort of tendencies are getting reinforced? And it's not something that we intellectually figure out. It's more about feeling into the moment like viscerally almost, like when the mind thinks like this, when the intention or motivation in the mind is like this, then it feels like this. And then the second instruction is to cultivate the good. Now, this is really important because it, it surprises us. Because if we're honest and we observe our mind, there's a lot of unskillful things that go on in our mind just being indulging in boredom, oh, nothing's happening. Just that sort of bored attitude is subtly or not so subtly unwholesome. But the, the real miracle is if we cultivate the good, we don't have to abandon what's unskillful because cultivating wholesome states of mind gives us immunity from so many of the mind's bad habits. When we're feeling kindly and generous, it's like my negativity, my defensiveness, my jealousy, my controlling tendency, judgmental tendencies, they just don't have any space to operate when I'm in a generous, loving space. So this is the real trick. Otherwise, we're sort of like this, um, surrounded by enemies, endlessly having to kind of put out fires here and there, and it's exhausting. And we end up, the attitude, if that's all we think we're doing is getting rid of the bad stuff, the attitude itself becomes unskillful. You know, we feel put upon. I've got a mind that's such a mess. Why did God do this to me? You know, all day long, I got to sort of be vigilant and so one of the things we're going to do tonight, I think I mentioned last week, is we'll do some loving kindness practice. Because our heart, I'm guessing I can say this with confidence, that everybody here, you know, the folks online and the folks in the room, I'm guessing that all of us can remember times when our heart was loving or kind or friendly or appreciative, or balanced, where the goodness of that mind state, let's call it, was undeniable. 
And it, it can be just ordinary moments. You're just hanging out with your dog. And your friendliness, your kindness towards your dog is unconditioned. It's like, it's not just when the dog is sweet that you love your dog. You love the whole package, right? Not always. I'm not saying we're always there. But there are moments, and we want to get a sense of that goodness because it's really important, not that we fake it or we pretend that the heart is good, but we have confidence in the capacity of the heart to be truly good, truly wholesome, truly balanced, truly open and sensitive, relaxed, clear. You know, it doesn't really matter what culture we'd go to. If we brainstormed, asked people to write down, you know, 15 qualities you've seen in your mind, your heart, that you find deeply trustworthy, we'd come, kind of come up with the same list, you know, clear, relaxed, kind, patient, forgiving, curious, bright, you know, alert, that kind of brightness. You know, we'd use different words, but we'd basically be covering the same ground. And the interesting thing is like, well, how do I cultivate the good? Well, we recognize it when we, not just we recognize like clarity or relaxation, but we recognize that it's good, that it's wholesome, that it leaves a good seed, plants a good seed, leaves a good impression on the mind stream. So when we've been really kind in an uncontrived way, not that you're trying to be kind, but you just notice your heart's really open and tender and loving in an uncontrived way. And then the interesting question is, in the, uh, the moments that follow, having been kind leaves a wholesome impression, right? It lingers. <laughs> just like if I've been really unwholesome, unskillful, that also lingers. Because who I am right now is conditioned by who I was 10 minutes ago or five minutes ago or even one moment ago. This continuation of our life, each moment we're expressing past impressions. Just like if we had a really lousy day that triggered a lot of negativity, then when you show up for class on Tuesday night, like it or not, some of what got laid down during the day is going to be reverberating that negativity, that hopelessness, or whatever it is that got set in motion. And so the reason I wanted to bring up this list, you know, abandon what's unskillful, cultivate the good, purify the mind, I'll just say briefly means we're developing that stability of present moment awareness so we know how to abandon what's unskillful and we know how to cultivate what's good. Because when the mind is superficial or distracted, right, or, or dull, it's not really able to abandon, recognize and abandon what's unskillful and recognize and cultivate what's good. And that's really all a human being, that's really all we need to do. Abandon, recognize and abandon what's unskillful, recognize and cultivate what's good, and develop the heart, the mind, so it has enough balance, stability of present moment awareness, continuity of present moment awareness, so it can do the first two things. And so tonight, usually week five, we take some time and we do loving kindness practice. But it is something we can do all day long. And it, it's really based on this premise that you should check out, which is the attitude or the mood is always in play. But the chronic habit for us humans, when we're in a particular mood, and you could even check like you might recognize whatever mood you're in right now, Kind of by definition, whatever mood we have, we think that's who I am. So part of that delusion is thinking that it can't change. 
well, this is just who I am. I'm angry right now. And I have, and then it's like, we've got our evidence, like why I'm angry. This happened to me today, this, or I'm feeling really good. And that's who I am. But the truth is, the mood, the attitude, the qualities of the mind, it's always, they're always changing. You know, just think about how many times in our life we've been in a deep funk, and now we're not. Or how many times we've been really happy, and now we're not. Things are always changing, the mood. And one of the things that really allows that is just to be honest. The mood is always in play. And that really helps. Like when we do loving kindness practice, it really starts with this faith that this heart is capable of being good. And I know the, my way back to that goodness. And I know how to water it with attention to keep it in mind. Because initially, like if I'm going to keep kindness in mind, well, there are many impulses in my mind right now, just stuff reverberating from the day. But what can I bring up? What can I pay attention to? So I'm watering that quality of kindness or that quality of compassion or that quality of joy or that quality of balance. These are the four, they're called the divine abodes, like abiding in divinity. But divinity means something different in Buddhism. You know, it's sort of in the, in the inherent goodness of the heart. So loving kindness, that basic goodness or basic friendliness. And when it runs into the difficulty in life, it naturally expresses itself as compassion, the tenderness, and that wish to alleviate the suffering of our own or others. When that basic goodness, friendliness runs into what is good in the world, then it expresses itself as appreciation, the joyful appreciation of what's good. And when things are confusing or ambiguous, it's that radiant balance of equanimity, like who knows what's happening, but I can be intimate and present even now. So there are like four qualities of the heart or four qualities of love. And I encourage you, I'll give a little introduction after we do our sit, um, and we'll kind of check out these four qualities, that this is something all day long for this next week or last week of the course, cultivating the good, just realizing that attitude is always in play. How hard would it be right now as I'm cooking dinner or getting myself to work or is hanging out in a business meeting I'd rather not be in, or whatever it is, might it be possible for the way I'm here, the way I'm showing up, to be sort of under the influence of one of these beautiful attitudes? Basic goodness, basic friendliness. Tender, if there's a lot of suffering inside and outside of us, tenderness, compassion. If I'm in a really nice setting, a lot of good is happening. Is that beautiful, not envy, but appreciation, right? And if it's who knows what's going on, well, then that beautiful, radiant balance. Like, I don't, like, it's really a free, I don't even need to know. I don't need to get tight about not knowing even how to define what's going on. I can be connected even if, when I don't have a clue. I can be open and responsive even when I don't know. And that's equanimity. And I'll prompt us during the guided sit tonight, something like, how's the attitude of the mind? And don't like, oh, I got to fix it. No, just notice it. And if it's an unskillful attitude that's there for whatever reason, just seeing it without judgment, seeing its unwholesomeness, seeing the kind of seeds or impressions that are getting left, that is the cause for abandoning it. It's like if you're holding a hot pan and you really notice this is hot, it leads to letting go. <laughs> you don't have to like, it's hot, I should let go. You don't have to say that. We let go when we see something that's unskillful, like your mind identified with anger, stewing with anger. If you really see it in a non-judging relaxed and clear way, it's the beginning of the end for the anger. The anger may reverberate in the body and around, 
But what's going to end is the mind mistakenly thinking that I'm that anger. What the wisdom will know instead is, oh, anger got triggered. I still feel it in the body, in the mind, doing its reverberation. Especially if we've been stewing a long time, when we let go of the identification, it's got some momentum. So it might continue to reverberate for even an hour. You know, if we've been really upset, really um, in, a, in a vortex of some kind with a negative emotion, it's really great to drop the identity, the identification rather, but we shouldn't expect it to just disappear from the body energetically. We, the system might be out of balance for a while, but we just keep knowing, like, oh, I can meet that with kindness. Like, oh, when you've been anger, angry for a long time, and then you drop it, it feels like this. <laughs> I care about that, because it hurts. It's yucky. But it's good to know, because seeing the uh, ill effects just deepens the sense, honey, be careful. Don't pick up that. Don't go take that off-ramp to anger or to lust. or to. And it's not the morality isn't coming from above. We're just learning directly in our own experience, like what leads to ease and what leads to dis-ease. And we're just learning the map of life. Oh, yeah, this doesn't help. So I'll prompt us a few times just to check the attitude. Don't judge, just notice. And you'll find actually it's easier to notice the unwholesome than it is the wholesome. So I'm just going to cue you. Notice the wholesome qualities and see how they get stronger just when you notice, oh, look at the body and the mind is calm. Oh, calmness is like this. And just that noticing and then the appreciation because you're... Uh, when we are, there are wholesome things going on, we appreciate them. That's not proud uh, pride. It's just recognizing goodness for goodness. Oh, this is really good. This feels good. This is planting good seeds, leaving a good impression toward ease and release, not towards contraction and heaviness. Good. So that's a lot. But let's. Uh, Take a moment, stretch your legs, whatever you need to do, so you'll be comfortable sitting for about 30 minutes. And after you've had a chance to stretch or whatever you need to do, then just settle into a nice posture for the meditation time. And even the settling process, just let it be infused with a basic kindness. Something like, yeah, I care about this body, so of course I'm going to really listen as I find an appropriate sitting posture for this body, for this meditation time. And if you take a few of those longer, deeper breaths, at the beginning, just let that be an act of kindness and compassion. We're not rushing, we're really taking care of this body and mind. And then eventually allowing the breathing just to just come into a natural movement. We trust the body, in fact, to do the breathing, however that might be. And we'll take a few minutes at the beginning of the set just to check on the attitude and to check in about the confidence that this heart is capable of being good. And there's many ways to touch into that confidence. You might 
as I do sometimes, I imagine myself holding <clears throat> our cat. And he's not one of those cuddly cats, but he'll let me pick him up and hold him close to my heart if I stand in front of a window. He'll let me do that for two or three minutes. And he'll purr and I just enjoy feeling the warmth of his body next to mine. And it's a, a moment or a few moments of a pretty pure kindness where I sense that he's feeling safe and happy and I'm feeling safe and happy. And it's a pretty pure kind of love. I'm not needing anything from him. I don't get the sense that he's needing anything from me in that moment. So I might just remember that simple moment. Oh yeah, this heart is capable of goodness. And of course, each of you will have your own way of bringing a memory to mind where you recognize that the heart was really good, friendly in such a natural and uncontrived way. Another relatively easy way is just to recognize the sitting body. And this body has been through a lot in our life. And in a way, our body's been the innocent victim of so much of our negativity. <coughs> Excuse me. Our thoughts, our negative thoughts, really affect our body. So we can now relate to the body with appreciation and kindness. And you can repeat some of these phrases silently in your own mind as I say them out loud. I really mean these phrases. I care about this body. I care about this body caring enough now to be close and just feeling what I feel. Not afraid to feel what I'm feeling here in the body. And we can sense this showing up, feeling the body as it is, as an act of kindness this willingness to be close. And I care enough for this body to wish well, a simple, sincere wish. May this body be at ease. May this body be at ease no matter the twists and turns of this life. May this body be at ease. And simply sense how this wish can be offered sincerely. May this body be happy and at ease. Just appreciate that goodness of the heart. And we can even sense the heart, the sensitive heart, right in the middle of things. I also care about this heart right here, right in the middle. The heart that senses everything, good and bad. I care about this sensitive heart right now, right here. I care enough to be close, to keep the heart in mind. I care enough to simply feel the feeling that's here now. And I care enough about this heart, this life right here, 
Just simply wish well. May this heart be safe. May wisdom and love protect this heart always. And may this heart be at ease with the changing conditions of this life. May this heart be at ease with the changing conditions of this life. I care about this sensitive heart right at the middle. I care enough now to keep it in mind, to practice not forgetting it. A heart that feels, a heart that knows. May wisdom and love protect this heart always. May the deepest wisdom and love protect this heart always. And may this heart be at ease, no matter the twists and turns of this life. May this heart experience deep ease and freedom, no matter the twists and turns. Sensing the goodness of this heart, the heart that's kind, caring, that's right here, right now. And may this goodness that's here, may it continue, may it increase, may it never end. May this goodness that's right here, may it continue, increase and never end. Almost as if there was this beautiful, radiant light or smile, just shining out in all directions, just the representing the goodness of the heart. May all beings be safe and at ease. Those near, those far, those beings that are known, all those that are unknown. May all beings be at ease. Love for its own sake in all directions, above and below, everywhere and every way. I will abide with this heart imbued with love and goodness, abundant, boundless, free from fear, free from ill will, I will abide. And you can drop the words and just see if you can keep in mind the goodness of the heart. It can be very subtle. The absence of ill will, the absence of fear and learn to really trust the goodness. And just abiding in silence for a while, keeping it in mind.
And as other experiences start to come into one's attention, become predominant, then you can just begin your awareness practice. Notice that these distractions are something being known, a thought is being known, pain in the body being known. And you can use your meditation anchor, just gradually switch over, whether that's being aware of breathing in and breathing out or this kind awareness of the whole body sitting. But let this attitude of kindness infuse your mindful awareness practice. Let them come together. Breathing in with kindness, noticing, feeling what that feels like. Breathing out with kindness, noticing what that's like. And even the desire to be present really comes from the self-compassion and kindness. And when strong distractions arise, you meet them in a friendly way. Oh, of course, sometimes it's like this. The mind thinks or worries or whatever. It feels like this. Can this be okay that it's like this now? Yeah. And then returning to your anchor if that's appropriate. So we'll sit for about 15 minutes in silence, just doing the best we can, cultivating this present moment awareness with kindness.
we remember. When we notice we've been lost in thought, caught up in some pattern, it's a good time to remember this possibility of kindness, forgiveness, understanding, no need to get frustrated. Be willing to feel what it feels like having been lost in thought. Notice, honestly notice any unwholesomeness that's been watered or set in motion. Be willing to feel the after effects so that the heart learns. And also be interested in the wholesome qualities that are there. Notice calm. Notice any steadiness of awareness. Notice the kindness, gentleness. Notice stillness.
And now if you've been practicing with your eyes closed, I encourage you to allow your eyes to open for these last three minutes or so. Soft gazing down toward the floor. So we're not looking around, but eyes open. And instead of relying on a particular anchor for your attention, just be aware of what's predominant one moment at a time. Just be aware, what, what's the mind knowing? What's the mind doing? So in a way, the object of meditation now we're keeping the present moment in mind but any object any experience will do because of course any experience is arising in the present moment Is it okay to relax? Remember those two qualities of relaxation and alertness and coming together. This experience is being known. Can this be okay? It's so simple. This wholesome desire to be present or intimate. And to simply let things be. And without rushing, but taking some time to adjust our bodies, stretch a little if you need to. And even this can be done with this attitude of kindness and mindful awareness. Last week, remember, we talked about, well, what gets in the way of the continuity of present moment awareness? Because it seems like it should be relatively simple for human beings to be present, you know, but it's when we actually check it out, it's really hard. I mean, we get moments, of course, but then lost. So what did you learn gets in the way of the continuity of awareness? And then when you recognize what gets in the way, what's a skillful way to be looking or opening to those, you know, whatever the tendency is. And remember the five hindrances, oh yeah, please. Yeah, so, and the, the reason this is so great, because it's, it's honest, it's actually what it is to be a human being. You know, we have these very, they're like edifices, these habits of mind, to be afraid, to be angry, to feel betrayed, to feel the victim. And because there's a way that we get drawn back into the existing patterns over the years. They really become like an edifice. Something starts as a, you know, something happens, but as it gets fed, it becomes part of one's character or personality. And uh, then, 
you know, we decide to take up the practice to be mindfully aware, and then all of a sudden we start to see it in its living color, and it can scare us. And like you said, you know, we, we hear something about loving kindness, and we try to bring loving kindness to it, but in a way we're already back on our heels, and so the loving kindness is sort of an attempt to get in control or to make things better. But that's not really loving kindness. So the interesting question, when you see some deep wound or deep pattern, deep habit of negativity, place of deep unresolved pain in your body, in your heart, in your mind, in daily life or during a sitting, remember we're not using loving kindness to make it go away. We're using loving kindness to get close. Oh, the heart's really hurting. The mind's really upset. I'm really disgusted with myself. I'm really disgusted with life. And I, that's exactly what I care about, right? We care about the edifice. We're not using loving kindness to get rid of the edifice. We're using loving kindness to have an honest relationship with the way it is. So loving kindness, that basic goodness that we uncover, that we learn to trust, it, its purpose isn't to sort of wipe the slate clean so all the woundedness goes away, all the negative habits go away. It's so we can have a more honest, intimate, oh yeah, this, this is what it's like to be a human being. This is what it's like to be Mark, an imperfect human being. Because I don't know about you, but one of the most clear and resonant truths is it's not easy being a human being. You know, in this conditioned world, swirling, first of all, we end up being conditioned by culture. We don't get to choose, pick and choose, all the different influences, all the different impulses that all got programmed in in very natural but impersonal ways. It's not like we went to some buffet and decided I want a little of this and a little of that, you know, and kind of came up with our own personality. No, it's just, it was through this conditioning process. And here we are, you know, like some of my tendencies to be defensive, to be critical, maybe arrogant, I don't like to admit that, but <laughs> so I'm told by my partner. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's a, there it is, there it is. So the question is, what are we gonna do about it? Not who do I wanna be, but how do I relate? When life, me, this body, mind, heart is like this, how am I gonna relate to that? And that's where awareness and that basic goodness really come in. Well, maybe I can, in a kind, compassionate way, just simply acknowledge the truth that it's like this now. It feels like this now. My heart's broken. My heart's angry. I'm really sad. I'm really exhausted. Or whatever it is. And it's, it has kind of a, a powerful effect that we have to check out to believe. Uh, one of my favorite teachers, um, Joko Beck, Charlotte Beck was her name, but her, she was a Zen practitioner. She started relatively late in life, but she lived a long time. And she died maybe 10 years ago in her mid-90s. And she started uh, the San Diego Zen Center, and she was the teacher there. She's written a couple of really great books that I encourage you to check out at some point. But um, she has this really beautiful image of, you know, you have ice, water, vapor. All of that is water, right? Same sort of molecular composition, whether it's in the ice form or the water form or water vapor form. And, she, you know, her simile is, you know, we basically go around most of the our lives as ice. We're solidified. We've got a very strong sense of self-centeredness and feeling apart and feeling alienated and feeling like 
all these characteristics of my personality are me in some permanent defined way. But every once in a while, especially if we have some effective spiritual practices, we start to relax and see clearly and we notice the watery nature of the ice. And maybe if we have a good sit or a good period of practice, we might even notice the more space-like, spacious-like quality, the vapor. But, you know, the habit to be afraid, the habit to be tight is strong. So we'll go back to being ice, but the, this is the part I like. She, she would say, but ice, then it doesn't forget its mushiness, even once it's become ice again. It, that impression of being open, of being loving, of being clear, of seeing deeply. Even when we're back in a contracted, self-centered habit of ours, we kind of remember. So that's like how things change over the years of practice. That edifice of fear or whatever it is for you that you were describing for us, um, or anger, whatever it might be for each of us, longing, there's, there's a whole kind of loneliness. It may still be there, but there's something else that's there, which is for lack, I mean, for, you know, there's not an easy way to describe it, but there's also a kind of space, a loving, wise space that holds all the different patterns of the personality. Oh yeah, sometimes it's like this. Like, my personality is the way that it always has been, but there's a lot of space around it. So when different patterns get triggered, there's just like this warm, oh yeah. And so I'm less likely to hold tightly to the pattern because I could just feel what it feels like. I don't have to act it out as much. The defensiveness, the critical mind, the judging mind. I notice I'm tight. I feel the impulse to want to do this zinger to my partner, right? I mean, this is not unusual. I think we all humans, if we pay attention in life, we start to um, notice, have this space around all these conditioned habits. And then in a way we start, we stop watering and feeding those habits because now we're aware of them. And when I'm aware of anger or that critical mind, but aware, not in a kind of like, oh, you're being bad, Mark, but aware from kindness point of view, oh, oh, this is unskillful, this isn't helping anybody. The tightness of this judging mind is unpleasant. Oh, honey, this is hard. It's hard being a human being. So when I'm aware from this, then I'm not feeding that tendency to be judgmental and critical because I'm aware of it. I feed it when I become, I identify like, oh yeah, of course I'm critical because this, you know, and then the mind, there's no space. There's, there's a complete or whole identification with the, that pattern of being critical and judgmental. And so, and then it gets wound up, it gets deeper, it gets stronger. But when we have awareness of it, so in that sense, in the, in the way the Buddha taught, it's much better to know your negative, you know, caught in a negative pattern than to not know. You would, you would think, well, if you know, you should stop. But no, sometimes the momentum of wisdom and awareness isn't as strong as the momentum of that habit. So we're going to get swept. You know, we know we shouldn't drive 20 miles to get a chocolate bar, but there we are in the car, you know, doing something silly. But there's some awareness. Oh, yeah, this is... This is called greed. This is called fear of not having a sense treat. You know? And it feels like this. It looks like this. And we can be aware of it even why, while the mind acts out in some way. This is a sign, actually, of real progress in practice when different unwholesome habits of mind express themselves. And, and wisdom has seen it and seen that it's unskillful and if it's unskillful, it has a contracting effect, right? So we're feeling 
the negative consequence. But that's good because it's the awareness that it's unskillful, feeling, seeing the unskillful consequence that breaks down the habit. We have to see that it isn't helping. And it's really good, like I didn't catch your name, but the previous person, it's really good to talk about things in an honest way because it normalizes what it is to be a human being. And that's the most important thing of this practice is to open to our experience, not the experience we want our, ourselves to be having, <laughs> but the experience the way it is, right? That's that word you hear a lot because it's so central to the Buddhist teachings, Dharma. In Pali language, it's Dhamma, but Dhamma or Dharma, it just means the way it is, the way it is. And uh, that's, that's the kind of integrity that we develop, like, what am I feeling? What's the feeling here? You know how it is sometimes we see with a friend that they're really out, you know, out of balance or upset, but we, how are you doing? So I'm fine. But you know, we know they're not fine. So that kind of integrity that when, I, when we're out of balance, when we're upset, wisdom and awareness knows, oh, it's like this. Just so you know, we have three drop-in loving kindness practice groups every month. First Friday of the month, I do. So that was, I guess, a week ago or so, 7 to 8.30. Then the third Friday of the month, uh, Jean Haley and Jane Ryerhouse do a self-compassion drop-in practice group, 7 to 8.30 on Friday night. And then the fourth Friday of the month, Stacey McClendon, another one of our teachers, does uh, drop-in loving kindness. So then there's real support. Um, for developing the, this practice. Um, and of course, there's much online uh, that guided meditations you can use, really good texts and stuff too that you can study. And like I said, there are a lot of different ways. You know, generally, traditionally, we start with ourself, but it's, but it, you know, if we have a lot of baggage, especially around self hatred or low self esteem, it may not be easy to start with ourselves. And then we might want to start with a more like what you might call a benefactor or a being that's easy to love. And I mentioned my cat. It doesn't have to be a human being. Because remember, all we're doing with the different reflections or memories or phrases is we're finding our way back to an authentic present moment experience where, hey, this heart is good. So we're using the memory or the image of a person or another being or a phrase to um, recognize the capacity of this heart. Oh, this heart can be friendly in a very pure, simple but pure way. And it's, it's good, it's beautiful. And then the idea is then once you kind of have a sense of the love, the next step is actually, and it sort of relates to what you were saying, Jess, is to notice it has a natural, unforced, but natural expanding nature. You could call it a radiance of love. And it goes, it naturally will go out in all directions. And you know how that is. Like, for whatever reason, if you find yourself in that open hearted, friendly, uncontrived, friendly place, You'll notice that even though it initiated when you were talking to one person, you know, as you leave and do whatever you're doing next, it's there. And even when you're shutting your car door, it's there, right? Because it goes out like a, a beautiful, loving light. It goes out and out, like light goes everywhere. It's very generous, a light bulb, right? As long as the shades are open or nothing is obstructing it, it just goes out. And that is a nice image for what we mean, you know, by loving kindness or this spiritual love. Sometimes it's just better to use a foreign word because, you know, we love hamburgers. <laughs> we use love in such a funny way um, in our English language. So metta, you might, if you read Buddhist texts, you might see the word metta, 
which usually gets translated as loving kindness or that basic goodness, basic friendliness. Karuna is compassion. Mudita is appreciative joy. Upeka is equanimity. Even equanimity is considered a attitude of love, that sort of radiant balance. So initially you might want to force it or give it, but what we're trying to do is more realizing that the love naturally wants to go out to those people that you've brought to mind or just naturally have come to mind. So when you're feeling that, it's really okay for different people in your life to come to mind, even people you don't really know, like a neighbor down the street. or And just to see that, yes, you too, may you be happy, that, that nobody's being thrown out of this heart because it's in a really friendly, good place. Even our enemies, I might really want to stop you from doing bad stuff, but I don't hate you. And you're deserving of love as anybody's deserving of love, right? A lot of the people doing terrible stuff in the world, they might do less terrible stuff if we all found ways to love them, even while trying to stop them from doing bad stuff. Right, so it, the love, it's just like, uh, you know, a really wise parent, they'll, they'll keep their kid from running into the street, even if they have to grab the kid, but it's not love, uh, it's not an absence of love, right? It's just that it, it, you can be fierce sometimes, or you can have a real open heart to the rattlesnake, as long as you have some distance, you're not going to go pet it, Right? So there's this open-heartedness doesn't tell us what to do. We just, it's just that sense that in the same way that I want to be safe and at ease, may you also be safe and at ease in your life. And to just notice, instead of having to force, just notice that it goes there. And like here, it's like, where else does it go? Is there anywhere it doesn't want to go? And then just don't force it <clears throat> like there may be somebody that there's a lot of pain around in a relationship. And then you just, you might initially go, well, I can have metta, I can have loving kindness for the pain I feel in that relationship with that person. But as you heal and, and really hold your own pain with more kindness and compassion, you might then realize oh, it's probably not easy for you to be a human being too. And I care about you too. So we don't have to rush it. We really want to notice that that boundless nature is an inherent quality of love. It really, like spiritual love isn't specific, but we'll use these specific, you know, images and memories to tune into it. But then we really want to see that it goes everywhere unhindered. Yeah. The way you can get that article online, Sharon Salzberg is one of our elders in the Western insight meditation or early Buddhist tradition, one of my teachers, a really wonderful teacher and, and a great writer and, and Buddhist author. And one of the great texts is something she wrote a while back now. It's probably 20, 25 years old, but still available called Loving Kindness, The Revolutionary Art of Happiness. But there's an article online you can just find in the Insight Journal. If you Google um, The Nature of Compassion by Sharon Salzberg, you'll get this. And that's where uh, Jennifer was mentioning uh, the point that Sharon made in this article. One of the points was when our heart is really pure, the friendliness, the goodness, the kindness is really pure, we're in that exalted saintly space. Like if we want to know what's the mind of a saint like, well, we have that mind. Maybe not that often, <laughs> but every once in a while, and it's not always in the special moments. It might be just a little interaction with a cashier, and there's just a real openness, just a smile or just real authentic friendliness. May you be at ease. May you have a good day. And... Uh, that purity of heart is like the saints that we want to be, right? They're just having those moments more often. And so it's really important this week, it's like part of our homework, 
is to notice those moments where the attitude is really pure, really good. Because we tend not to notice it. We tend much more to notice when our attitude is really off and negative, right? And then the key is when you notice that really wholesome, open-hearted moment, really almost like you want to taste it. And you want to notice that it's, it's an inherent capacity. It's like it's there not because all these right conditions were there. That just brought it out, out, out into the open. But the capacity is always there. And being interested in those really beautiful, wholesome, good states is really what keeps them coming back, keeps them becoming, uh, having more momentum. So they arise more often. Yeah. So let's just do a short reflection to end our evening. Just sit comfortably. One uh, ancient Buddhist practice that you might want to just weave into your day, maybe before you go to bed at night, but especially after you've been involved in something wholesome, like on a busy day, probably for most of us, we've come to this class, we've put in our hour and a half, cultivating something that's really good for us and good for the world, this capacity to be kind and present. So let's just notice the goodness that we've been cultivating in our practice and this evening together. And may this goodness continue, may it increase and may it never end. And remember moments of patience today or moments of forgiveness, a moment of being fearless. There's a lot of goodness in our lives. In this ancient practice is we recognize the goodness in our lives and then we dedicate it, we offer it. And traditionally we offer it first to our parents, even if they're dead and even if they weren't very good parents. May all the goodness in my life somehow support the well-being, the happiness and the freedom of my parents. And may any goodness in my life, the goodness from taking this class, the goodness from my meditation practice, may it be a cause for happiness and well-being for my friends, all my family, for all the folks I'm taking this class with, all my neighbors and colleagues at work, and all beings without exception. May I always practice and live my life for the benefit of all beings. May any goodness in my life be happily given away in a cause for happiness and well-being in all directions. May, may this be so. So there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's called sharing the merit, or you could say sharing the blessings of your life. So I think it'd be great. No one's going to see you, right? Just so before you go to bed or when you get up or after your meditation or before you have a meal, just because it's so useful to take 20 seconds and to ask yourself to remember all the good that your heart's been involved in just recently, right? And then like realize that good is a force of good. And I'm going to do something good with it. I'm going to give it away energetically, right? May this good be a cause not only for my own happiness and well-being, and then you can, you know, bring people to mind that may somehow the goodness in my life, and you don't need to know how it's going to do that (laughs) because it's the good wish itself that's good, not whether it's actually going to, maybe it will, maybe it won't, but wishing that my goodness support you in the room and you online, that's good. How do I know? I can feel that it's good. So play with that, sharing the merit. And we'll do it again next week. Shelly will be here next Tuesday night to do the last class. Shelly Graff, who you saw, I think Shelly was here on uh, week two. 
and uh, hope to see you down the road. There are many things to get involved with. Shelley will go through that next week, like other ways to support your practice at the center. But just check out the calendar, see what else might make sense down the road for you. Have a good last week of practice. It's really been nice getting to know you all and hope to see you down the road somewhere. Bye-bye now.